Okay, ladies and gents, um, something a little different from us uh, for this review. Um, it's a nipple. <laughs> oh. There you go. Out of nowhere, not even prompted. That was a detour. Um, we, uh, we usually um, tackle new albums um, yep. on our podcast, on our YouTube channel. <laughs> we usually talk penises, but <laughs> it's nipples. <laughs> um Little changes is, is as good as a rest, Duncan. Uh, so I thought that would be quite nice for uh, for this review. Um, for this review, though, we have been checking out the new Justin Pearson documentary, Don't Fall in Love with Yourself. Dave, who is this Justin Pearson of which you speak? Justin Pearson. Who, <laughs> who is, is this Justin guy? Pearson? Um, Don't Fall in Love with Yourself is um, a documentary that explores the enigmatic musician and artist Justin Pearson. From childhood tragedy to his rise in the San Diego punk scene, Don't Fall in Love With Yourself takes an in-depth look at a career made out of blood, sweat and spit. Uh, the documentary is uh, globally available now on VOD. Um, you can uh, rent it, uh, purchase it on Vimeo and VHX. I'll put some links below so you can check it out. Um, also, um, had a, a run of screenings this summer um, at venues including St. Vitus in New York and Dead Brain Studios in Los Angeles. Uh, the documentary was also released on Blu-ray through Vinegar Syndrome and ETR Media. I love Vinegar uh, Syndrome as well. That's and awesome. features Good limited fact. edition art from the acclaimed artist Steak MTN. Um, links below to all that sort of stuff. So, um, why why have we chosen to review this uh, documentary, Duggan? Um, we um, we were asked to. No, <laughs> <laughs> one yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Two, um, we uh, we've been dealing with three one G records for the last couple of years, reviewing albums yeah. for the website or YouTube channel. Um, and Which is we, weird that I never put the two things together, and then I kind of <laughs> felt like a fucking idiot watching this. So, Justin, um, if you're watching this, I felt like an idiot fucking watching this. So, um, yeah, I thought we've always really enjoyed the stuff that Justin sends over. Um, the bands yeah. that are on that label have always been. Um, just you know, there's a certain quality about them. Um, very original, very yeah. authentic, yeah, unique. Yeah, um, the, like the most recent one I think was Squid Pisser that we did, uh, that I we reviewed. Love Squid. I love that album. I really, um, really do. I think that fucking album is the tits. But like the the roster is incredible. They've got like Dead Cross, Swing Kids, The Locust, mm-hmm. which we're going to come on to, um, but also their their past list of artists is also ridiculous like cattle decapitation put out their yep. early releases on 31g as well as bands like netherlands who we've discussed and reviewed in the past mm-hmm. about a fucking killer album this year oh, yeah. um also i got quite a like a what the fuck moment as well when i was looking through the lists of uh, of artists um i don't know if you remember this guy you remember a guy called cool keith yes cool <laughs> from, keith from way back yeah cool keith was on 31g as well <laughs> Like I was just like, what? Is he creating a list of people that weren't on that label yeah, now? For sure. Um, Honestly. Yeah, Cool Keith was a, a rapper slash producer from the Bronx. That's right. Um, he put out an Fucking album. hell, man. That's a blast from the past. Yeah. Um, I think it was uh, Black Elvis Lost in Space was the album. That's that right. I, Black I used to play oh, that. my God. The, was so getting listened to before bed. Yeah, the kind of green cover. It was just like, um, yeah, gave that hundreds of spins back in the day. Um, so yeah, great roster, like past and present, um, which had me kind of excited to, to check this out. Um, and this is like, it's a very intriguing look at um, Justin Pearson as an artist, the kind of yeah. like the music scenes that he grew up, grew up in, the bands he played in, and then the eventual kind of creation of uh, 31G. Plus a whole load of other stuff that I was not expecting. Like there was yeah. moments in here I was like, okay, I didn't realize this is where we were going on this. Um, and for like people out there who like like a good documentary, um, you, you're in for a real treat here. Um, mm. uh, I found like a lot of this made me feel really nostalgic. Um, firstly, because it kind of reminded me like, when I was watching it, it kind of reminded me of like remember like those old like the VHS and the DVDs of the the band documentaries we used to buy and watch like back in the yeah, day. Yeah, I'd like, like yeah. the the con, like, there's, there was a, there's certain you know, things uh, that remind you of like, oh there's a I can't watch any of the Pantera videos without like yeah. drinking, um, yeah. Yeah. because like what, like you used to like oh you watch like any of the Pantera three videos, any of the 
the three documentaries. Like at the end of it, if you did not want to be in a band and did not want to be on stage, then you were fucking dead inside. Yeah. But um, like the corn stuff as well, like you yeah. see those like the gritty early days of bands being like not famous. Mm-hmm. And yeah. trying to like pull together, and if you've ever been in a band, and I'm not saying it's a prerequisite to watching this, but if you've ever been in a band, this is why the this is Spinal Tap is so smart uh, as a kind of satirical look at music and the industry in general. Mm. Is you have all you like every member of that band you've interacted with in a band if you're a musician (laughs) um and every conversation with a venue or a promoter or something like they're they're so well the same way that i I think like the office encapsulates the experience of working in an office because you've always worked with that guy that does that one thing or that woman that does one thing watching this reminded me at times of the best times of being in a band and the yeah. fucking worst times of <laughs> yes. being in a band. Like moments yep. where that, like I've said to you multiple times, there's part of me that like so misses being on fucking stage yeah. and, and doing music. I it was the, the, the time that was probably, as a musician, like the happiest. Mm-hmm. But those 30 minutes on stage are surrounded by... yeah. Anxiety, misery, stress, yep. fucking all that shit. Mm. And this documentary just encapsulates all of it. Yeah. It just it not only encapsulates it, but it just, you live it, whether yeah. it's like the experience of trying to craft not only a sound, but a, like a vision and a look. We had that, I remember we had that conversation about should we kind of dress more formally yep. and everyone was in on that except the bass player who thought we were trying to dictate what he could wear <laughs> yeah. and didn't understand why he couldn't wear football tops on stage and we're like well the rest of us are all wearing metal tops is that sort of shit and you mm. see it in like the conversations where people are just button yeah. heads against artistic integrity versus whatever I think it really does it encapsulates that really well plus it spans I like a it spans a time period specifically. Mm. I, I don't know how old Justin is, but mm. I don't think he's far off our age. I think he's in his forties. Yeah, so I don't like so a lot of what he's going through timeline wise mm. mirrors. Although he's like obviously was much more successful than what we were, <laughs> uh, but it mirrors a lot of when he was getting into writing music. I was kind of getting into music and learning an instrument. Yeah. When he was like out playing in bands, I was starting to want to play in bands. Mm-hmm. When he was signed um i was starting to demo with bands and all mm. of this so i feel there's a i feel like you get a lot out of this if you've ever been what I'm, a long way of saying is if you've ever been in a band i think this actually plays really well to you and if you've never been in a band before yeah. there's a peek behind the curtain here where you're like that oh so it's not all like fucking a brandy glass full of brown m&ms and <laughs> you know <laughs> like a fluffer before you go on stage um, those things are few and far between you know what yeah. I mean, and most of the time it's kind of sitting there going, am I doing the right thing, mm. am I wasting my time, am I ever going to see a penny for what I'm doing, can I make a living for this, and what do I do when I'm not touring mm. and that's this documentary in a big old nutshell, yeah. I don't know how many musicians Notwithstanding the Mastodon documentary, which is brilliant if you want to watch it, mm. get as many cracks at yeah. different bands yeah. before they land the thing that ultimately will become what is, they are known for synonymously, notwithstanding the record label work, but the one that has a legacy. Mm. Because as soon as you were like that, it was in the Locus, I was like that. Oh, I fucking rem- I like instantly, like, pff, like time travel <laughs> back like a decade, and I was like, I, I remember the locust. I remember yeah. thinking they were the most extreme, bizarre shit I'd ever heard. And by that point, I'd heard yeah. Dillinger. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm still convinced I've seen them live. But there's no evidence. <laughs> I've checked the internet. I don't know if I ever did, but I'm still convinced I was. Uh, yeah. So, um, in terms of like you, like, because this starts back at his childhood and then finishes yeah. with him now. Yeah. And we get a nice arc actually in it. But. Yeah. I've watched quite a lot of doc. I'm a big documentary fan. Mm. How did you like? Because I like whenever we talk, we never talk about documentaries. You watch movies and TV shows and all the rest. Mm. How did you get on with the? It's not particularly long, but it covers no. a lot of years on the road. Yeah. So how did you get um, on with? Yeah, I 
I, I thoroughly enjoyed this. Um, I loved the way that they'd kind of spliced all this together. Um, it's kind of shot in a similar way to some of those old kind of documentaries we watched in that kind of early 2000s. Um, there's a load of kind of like small interviews with various band members and friends. So you've got like Travis from Cattle Decap, uh, Dave Lombardo. Which I never put together, by the way. I no. didn't know that was a thing. And then I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. Yeah, early, they were on early 3-1G as well. Um, then you've got Dave Lombardo from Slayer, uh, Jerry Bohm from um, Tushi Amore, and then obviously Justin Justin himself, um, given like large parts of, of the interviews as well. Um, but they've kind of spliced it all together with like old like video camera footage. Mm. Um, there's like live bits of live shows in there. Um, plus, like uh, I like the way they kind of like reenacted some moments from his life as well. That they kind of re-recorded yeah. that. That was really cool. Um, and then some nice kind of aerial shots of, of different cities and stuff when they're talking about the different areas. Um, I found it a, an incredibly fascinating story um, covering his life growing up, um, but not just from like a musical point of view, which is what I expected this documentary yeah. to be about. Yeah, yeah. Um, this saying. delves into his kind of personal side that I didn't expect at all, um, going into detail with his relationship with his father, who was a, abusive and an alcoholic and... His relationship with uh, his mother um, post his father's murder, basically, yeah. um, and the, the abuse that he suffered after that as well. Um, and, and how that... refreshing to have a documentary which ends in a position where, like, generally when you show that stuff and mm. the you know his kind of kind of self ostracization from his mother, like yeah. kind of like, well, if you don't, it's my way or the highway, and I'll just move out. Yeah. sort of thing and then being in a position where not only is she like a talking head on the documentary mm-hmm. um, but at the end you have like the kind of outtakes where he's actually sitting and they appear to have a yeah. super healthy relationship yeah. which you do I'm used to not that in documentaries I'm yeah. used to that's the talking head and never the two will meet yeah. but seeing her even try on the mask at the end yeah, like yeah. the locust mask and all mm-hmm. like that it's fucking great he, like it ends in such a healthy place yeah Whereas if like the first 15 minutes of this, you're like that, oh, right, we're about to get into some fucking shit. Like yeah, now. Yeah. And you do, but there's, it ends on such a positive note that it I does. think it kind of makes the journey even sweeter. It does, yeah, sense. I'd agree, totally agree. Um, I think what I really appreciated the most was just his honesty during these, yeah. these interviews. Um, you know, there are parts of it that are quite hard hitting um, because he, he doesn't really sugarcoat it at all. He's quite a straight, talking guy um but i think that honesty and openness is one of the things that kind of kept me really engaged throughout the the documentary um i i loved hearing that kind of like the, the kind of this beginning story of like finding a skateboard behind like a, a burger king or whatever yeah. and then like that was his kind of introduction to you know getting into then punk music and, and metal and then get a bass guitar and and basically, like touring from a very, very young age. He's fourteen, um, I think, and he's out <laughs> on tour, like, which is fucking nuts. Crazy, like various punk and hardcore bands. Fourteen, um, I was in Chess Club, right? Like that's the only thing. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, like, oh, what the fuck? Oh, fuck. Um, which yeah, it goes right through that um, that whole kind of journey into like the the label and and also acting as well, which I'll come back mm. to. But um, in in amongst all that, you're getting this really kind of wild part of the documentary um so there there are loads of moments that in amongst this where you're just like what the fuck like yeah. just like moments of like when he drops things like yeah he was like 13 years old and he got a fake id and he just like went into tijuana like a different tijuana country. Just, <laughs> like we're just gonna go and <laughs> like, tour tijuana and i'm fake like ID. what you no sneak into the country to go and see like GBH and Circle yeah. Jerks and stuff like that. I was just like, at 13 years old, that is kind of insane. Um, there's also um, a lot of cock and a lot of vomit in this documentary as well. Yeah, well, we referenced um, in the podcast that this review will be attached to as well. We yeah. did mention that we have viewed a lot of cock. And I, I mean, that might be misconstrued as to each other's cock. Um, that's a different podcast. Um, <laughs> no, there is. There's a lot. There's, I said, oh, the, the funny thing I found about this is that, that yeah, we would play, they basically rented a house and that yeah. became their venue. Mm-hmm. And there was this one guy that always showed up and always ended up naked. Yeah. And I'm like that, like, well, how did he always get in? Um, <laughs> and it is, there's a lot of, a lot of dick. 
Yes, a lot, of, and it's not there censored. Is. So if no. you are averse <laughs> to the full frontal male nude form, mm. then I'm just going to say it's a warning. It's in there. Um, yeah, that and, yeah. and vomit. There's a lot of vomiting. Um, the vomiting thing was like hugely fascinating to me, but yeah. I cannot, I cannot eat within an hour of running mm-hmm. because ah, I right, okay. mm-hmm. Like I like viciously throw up. It has yeah. to be out with, and it can be like I'm not saying like an hour and one minute, and I won't vomit. Mm. Uh, but like if there's an, like an hour and a half in a bit, that's enough time for my stomach to settle. If I eat like fifty minutes and then like go for a run, I will throw up. Mm. And it's, it's pretty horrible. So the the way the drummer describes his his playing as, and you see him playing, and I understand it is so physically exhausting. Mm-hmm. Um, the way he plays, yeah. that the fact that he, when he finishes, and he was like, I don't understand what happens when I finish. The reason it happens that's because you're not concentrating on what you're doing. And at <laughs> that point, your body's like, fine, like yeah. break, breathe, yeah. let's go. Mm. The fact that he gets to a point where he's timed it to a fine art, like he has a bucket at the side, <laughs> yeah. he can finish the song and get the spew in yeah. the in the bucket, yeah. and then continue playing. Is one of those details that I just find, like, I also love the honesty of the projects. Like when when Justin's talking about what what he was doing, he was like that. I was in this political kind of punk band, mm. and we were doing what we were doing, but it was too serious. And yeah. as a result, we struggled to get people engaged because we couldn't break out of that. So the next thing I did, you know, I aimed away from that, and it was more jazzy and free form, and it was mm. designed in a different way to get people in. Yeah. But even then, it was kind of like that trial and error. Mm. Like being honest about that, there's a lot of people who'll be like that. Yeah, this is my first band, and they don't acknowledge anything that they did before. Yeah, they yeah. don't like celebrate the success. But like music is about trial and error. Mm-hmm. It's about finding the thing that fits. The thing. Yeah. Like, it's, it's like it's like it's what they say about like very few bands strike gold mm-hmm. do a lot of digging they find a lot of fool's gold the, the, the thing that they think is going to make them rich but they yeah. very seldom get the thing that made them rich mm. and it's interesting of all the projects he had the one that was the most obscure <laughs> yeah. the most obtuse and the most out there yeah. is actually musically the one that he'll be most remembered for mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like we all remember the locust and the reason I think I think personally we can always remember the locust is because I remember buying Kerrang and mm-hmm. seeing that fucking like the, the way they looked. I remember like every publication saying, This is the most out there shit you'll hear, yeah. and be like that. <laughs> I'm the judge of that, <laughs> and then hit and play, and then be like that. Yeah, <sighs> how'd I get like how'd I get a hook into this? Yeah, yeah, um. I don't ever think I heard their debut, but like the 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 first proper album, the first mm. f- proper produced album, which is funny when they're talking about how they were accused of selling out, yeah. which is hilarious when you listen to that. Because I went back and listened to yeah. uh, post listen to documentary go that how anyone could accuse, and this is like before Dillinger really became Dillinger, it's before the Mike Patton stuff. Mm. Even then, the Mike Patton stuff is more the Dillinger stuff with Mike Patton. I think is aged interestingly. <laughs> it is not like like when you listen to like fucking uh, like calculating infinity, which mm. comes like a year afterwards. There is a huge fucking gulf between those two sims. Yeah. But listening to that back, go like that how anyone could accuse them of selling out shows how fucking shallow minded anyone could be. Like yeah. so ahead of their time, like yeah. so ahead of their time. Yeah. There are God knows, like Squid Pisser being a great example of that. There are a multitude of bands that I listen to now that I could link back to the Locust and be like that. All right, I I see the the like the seeds of an idea from there through. Mm. Mm. Um, but it's like the one that like. Like, the least likely thing you should be yeah. famous for or have the most success f- I know. from I know. is the thing. And the more they piss people off. Like, I remember them already having the costumes. Yeah. I don't remember them looking like mods. Yeah. Um, which is fucking... Ill- like, you imagine... We we played a... We played a hardcore gig. Like, once. Yeah. We, we opened for Walls of Jericho as a fucking progressive technical death metal band. Um... And we were booed 
<laughs> like we were we were booed by the hardcore fans in there yeah. for not like not being hardcore. Yeah, almost got I, into a fight. <laughs> yeah, I can't I can't imagine being those guys. Yeah, and walking at the stage dressed dressed like that and yeah. like being booed. But also there was the one of the talking heads like is like that. Yeah, like they're like uh, we got heckled by some musician or something. Mm. It's some like guy, some prominent guy in the scene uh, until we played our first song. And when that first song finished, we could see it in his face. And once again, not to keep liking us back to those, but we used to get, we used to, we could never be put in a bill with a band that sounded like us. Mm. And we used to never get a sound check. But yeah. at the end of that first song, you could yeah. look at it, you just see people going, what the fuck was that? Because we're yeah, just yeah. heavier than everyone else. Mm. We weren't as intense as these guys. No. Well, you'd show me any hardcore band from that, that time that played like that. Mm. How do you... And they opened for the Yeah Yeah Yeahs, which... The, <laughs> yeah. The support slots were just insane. Nuts. Like, just, what like, is going it's on? Like, almost like, well, they can't... Well, they might as well be the Locust. Uh, yeah. Andrew <laughs> WK as well. Like, what? <laughs> like, How? Could, could you imagine going, like, like, like Party Hard is your favourite <laughs> song of the summer and you finally buy your ticket to see Andrew <laughs> WK and the opening man's a Locust <laughs> with a drummer spewing into a bucket in between tracks. <laughs> yeah. Insane, man. I, I found that part of the, the documentary was really interesting um, yeah. because I, I knew who the locusts were. Like I, I'd seen them um, growing up, listening to metal, the, the bug yeah. suits and stuff. Um, but I didn't really know like the half of how that band became to be and the various incarnations they had. Different members that went yeah. through it as yeah. well, um, and then the, like the the emphasis on that particular synth sound being something prominent like yeah. that's what makes us stand out that's yeah. what makes us different yeah. and that's not just a thing at the side that needs to be like a core element in the mm. band yeah and then the evolution of the look of the band which mm. ultimately becomes that you really see and you don't often get that what we usually get is the final package of what a record label wants you to see a yeah. band look like yeah and in this one, you actually get the creative process behind it, which is hugely fascinating. Mm. Um, once again, as someone that's been in a band and been like, should we all like, should we all jump at this point in a song? <laughs> like those moments, which feel so banal and so twee, mm. to an audience member, are the moments to stand out. Like, mm -hmm. did they all mean to jump at the same time? Yeah. You know, like those sorts of things like make a live show seem different. And the fact that you see that we were in a thrift store and we just happened to find five rolling fucking hairy fucking waistcoats and that's <laughs> yeah. just a look now. Yeah. I love that. I, I like I genuinely do. That's what I'm saying. Like I think if you've ever been in a band that's really mm. rewarding and I think yeah. if you haven't, it kinda makes you I less jealous or less unknowing of what actually goes into behind the process. It might actually yeah. open your eyes and see how difficult it is. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't realise the amount of hate that they got. Like I didn't like them talking about people we, throwing like, when we were glasses hearing about at them. them and... It was kind of post that, you know what I mean? They yeah. were already established. Yeah. And maybe they were getting hate for their support slots, but mm. it, it, like that whole run of them just kind of finding an identity and yeah. being put on the wrong bills consistently. Mm -hmm. I get yeah. that. I understand. Like it's that poser thing of the the poser band in our scene. Mm. Um, but I'm not, like when I was listening to them, I was like that. Like they're not a hardcore band. No, they're playing with hardcore bands. I know why they're lumped in there, but they're not a hardcore band. Yeah. Like like you put them on a jazz bill, they probably still get the same hate, but I actually probably appreciated more. We listen to like uh, Imperial Triumphants, like that band that we talk about a lot of being like a band to you like that. What do they sound like? <laughs> um, like try to work it out yeah. like I imagine them around the same time as the locusts coming out with fucking golden masks and fucking black robes yeah. and they probably get the same hate yeah. well, it's just that, like an audience that aren't prepared for that level of yeah. theatrics to line up with the sound mm. and yeah. it's kind of almost against the scene but actually mm. if anything it's one of those things that just added to the sound that we're doing yeah yeah, that was that was really interesting. Just that kind of whole movement from there into then eventually signing that kind of big deal um, with uh, Anti or Anti, which was like the other half of Epitaph. Um, 
That and was they're really talking about who, like, we were like, we were called it for being shills for that. And within two years, look at all the bands that signed <laughs> yeah. with Epitaph. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, I, I get it, man. It's frustrating as fuck. Yeah. He obviously got a little clip of uh, Brett from Bad Religion as well, giving his kind of take on it as well, which was cool. Um, and even though there's, like, he's been in, like, a ton of bands, I'm, I'm glad they focused on, on The Locust because... Um, there was a lot of really cool footage that they've caught for the documentary yeah. um, and the, the kind of first uh, big budget kind of album that they had as well, the kind of recording of that um, and the mad things that happened on tour. So that oh, was God, really cool yeah. to see. Um, there's also, we need to mention obviously the uh, the other moment of the documentary. Oh, like the like the, the point of fucking genius on the documentary? It's it's kind of bizarre because when it, when it started to play that bit in the documentary... Um, and this is the Jerry Springer part of the documentary. Yeah. Um, they started talking about it, and Justin explains like how it came about. They were like, just like he was living with an, another guy, his buddy Scott, and they called up the Jerry Springer show. They left a message, and they made up this whole story about like Justin cheating on his girlfriend with his roommate. Um, and then out of the blue, they get this call back from Jerry Springer's team to say, "We want you to come on the show, and like we're going to." like put this in a, an episode of Jerry Springer I was like alright fuck I didn't, didn't realise about this but when they actually started to show it I was like I've fucking seen this I've, I've seen that clip I've as watched well this. I had never put that together no. never put that together me neither uh, a lot I of would... people don't understand that like a lot of uh, I peeked behind the curtain I look, there was a there's a, a I enjoy as a pastime and I don't know why I enjoy this right but I enjoy as a pastime uh, listening to like old school wrestlers talk about their time in the industry. I right. don't know why I do it. I don't follow wrestling, mm-hmm. like pro wrestling that is, at all nowadays. Yeah. But like people that were involved with it in the 90s when I did watch it, I am fascinated by the stories about like what was going on in the business at the time. Like borderline obsessed with it. Mm. And um, what I didn't realise until following quite a lot of them is there's a lot of amateur pro wrestlers did Jerry Springer right yeah uh-huh. and they were actively sought out by Jerry Springer like mm. the team behind that would like because obviously it makes sense you you hot shot it the shows become more salacious and more like it was people remember there was a time where there was like fights only happened once yeah. and then by five years into it people were like yeah. walking out and instantly fighting yeah yeah, and just they'd run and out. That's, right that's literally like they hot shot it to the point of they yeah. give people entertainment. So he and his experience is obviously before yeah. that run goes, but yeah. no one's telling me for one second that TV executives didn't do their due yeah. diligence and knew yeah. who this fucking guy was. Like that's the the fact he was like that to this day. I get people come up mm-hmm. to me on the street and go, like you were sleeping with your girlfriend like that. You are like this. Well, that goes to show the impact of it. Yeah. But I had seen yeah. that before. Yeah, so did And I. it blew my fucking mind when I was like that. No fucking... Like that, it's just a guy that looks like him. And he's yeah. like, explained it all out. He's explaining the point where he like... He kind of... He's kind of went off stage and all the rest. And the mm. police are like that. We'll fucking arrest you if you don't. We will arrest you if you don't go back out and finish this fake TV show. <laughs> and you're like, what fucking what? Only in America. Yeah. Would never happen to you. But you're like, yeah. what fucking world are we in right now? Mm. And like the culmination of that, and the fact he never managed to realistically make any money off it, <laughs> like link it back to the fact he it wasn't like bass player of the locust. You know, like arresting yeah. on the screen. It's one of those weird things where you're like. It's like, we talk about, like, there are moments in your life where you're like, this would make a great story, and this guy's whole documentary is just, this would make a great story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You'll never believe what I, it's like Forrest Gump, you know, in 1990, like, there's, like he's honestly, he's been everywhere, yeah. and all these, like, huge historical moments and entertainment, he's been in the background of them. Yeah. Um, it blew my mind, man. Yeah. And he, he did, like they did not fake punch him in the face. <laughs> he takes he fucking he takes he punch oh he proper full on not well placed punch right to his dish <laughs> yeah. from that chick. 
Yeah, that was that was really fascinating. Even the stuff where he was kind of talking about behind the scenes, the stuff that yeah. went on, and stuff yeah. that didn't actually get aired either, where he was almost fighting with someone in the crowd and stuff as well. I thought that was really interesting. Um, but that's then obviously led on to after that, where he's kind of got involved in a little bit of acting as well, did yeah. a bit of voiceover work. Um, he and worked also, with Azure Gentle, which got me hard. Well, as when I heard that name, I was like, "All right, Duncan's yeah, going to have a Azure good Argento is daughter of Dario Argento, mm. um, and she's a fucking. I love her as an actress. She's a great actress. She's a great director as well. The fact he got involved with that project's kind of fucking amazing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like he does voice acting, like you mentioned before. His voice works so like the animation they showed when really he's good. voicing it. Fucking great. Yeah. Like like totally, totally works. And yeah, we kind of finish up with him like a little bit of a reunion with the Locust. Mm. Um and still active in bands, still active with his label, obviously, mm. putting out a documentary yeah. and just talking about the fact that he doesn't really have an off switch. <laughs> yeah. Like when he, in his downtime he's still working on other projects, so it's mm. not really a downtime. Um, very creative guy like just hugely even, creative even like, some people are stuff. just born to be like not experts in anything but just really good at a lot and he's yeah. really 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 good at a lot it yeah. seems that whatever he turns his hand to yeah. he gives enough reverence and attention mm. to try and make a go of it yeah. like even the stuff that was kind of that were failures you could see he put everything into it mm. Um uh, yeah, a, the, it's a square, brilliant square vinyls and stuff like that. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, like <laughs> crazy man, or shaped like it's a just puddle. A really, really, really well. It's a well placed and really well put together documentary. Yeah, that by good. the end, uh, I feel like me and Justin could go up for a beer, and I, w- I would have like the the best night. Yeah. Just, like, I wouldn't run out of things to talk about. Yeah, for sure. Um, and that's kind of what I think he's inviting you into his life in his yeah. experience and like I say the fact that you get like the outtakes at the end and he's sitting with his mum kind of made me I'm a sappy with stuff like that as well like I come from a single parent like household and all the rest and mm. like I understand it's not fucking easy especially with boys it's not fucking easy yeah. um, and seeing them like have that relationship with her just kind of warm my heart at the end yeah. really 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 well done it's one of those things that like I said before if you're in a band check it out if you've ever been interested in what things are like in a band, fucking check it out. If you want to be in a band, check it out. If you're thinking about starting a band, <laughs> check it out. But if you're looking for something that just gives you a peek behind the curtain of creativity mm. and what it is to be yeah. a creative person, it's a fucking great example of that. Because yeah. you get the highs, the lows, the swings and the misses. It's mm. fucking awesome. Yeah, it's it's like ninety minutes as well, so it's like it's oh, not... you breeze right through it. It's, yeah. it's a great, it's a great concise watch. And what I love more of the effort is like actual established musicians just got that. I didn't get the locust. Uh, it was just kind of like <laughs> silly. She's a little bit out there where I was like, ah, get, right, okay. Yeah, I was like, that was me when I first heard them. I was yeah. like, that why is Kerrang pushing this band so hard? I don't get. It. <laughs> um, yeah, and also, um, yeah, once again. We will find out eventually. We will solve the mystery of the Duncan see them live. <laughs> I've checked. Yeah. I've checked the internet. They definitely played venues I was at, mm. but I'm not sure if it was the Locust or we butter the bread with butter. And the bands don't even sound alike. <laughs> Morph suits may have been involved. Mm. Um, yeah, I, 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 I thoroughly enjoyed it. And when I got to the end, I was like, I was really enjoying those little snippets of the Locust live. I was like, oh, this is great. I hope they give us like a whole load of that stuff. Um, and it doesn't really appear on the documentary at length. But yeah. afterwards, I found out that the Blu-ray that they released has a ton of live footage from the Locust oh, one. So there's like, um, that up, to be honest. With you. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a additional kind of audio commentary. Um, more interviews um, and then there's like three or four different sets from the, the Locust as well on there. Yeah. Um, so Vinegar Syndrome, cool. the label that you mentioned that I put in there, yeah. are actually a really good label for kind of bespoke and kind of avant-garde releases of mm. kind of, they do a lot of kind of B-movie content. Mm. So I've got like a lot of Vinegar Syndrome stuff in my, my shelves just because of the horror stuff that I love and all the weird exploitation and grindhouse stuff. Yeah. Um, so it's a great fit for, for that. So I'll see about 
Pick him up and change it out. Yeah, uh, nice. But I did go back. I did go back and listen to like a couple of albums and was just like, this is still. Even <laughs> nowadays, even yeah. though music has acclimated to it, they still sound so different than than yeah. some of the weirdest fucking shit we've listened to of late. So yeah. they're still ahead of their time, weirdly. Yep, hundred percent. Um, okay, so um, yeah, I'll put all the links and stuff below to the, the documentary, so you can check out the uh, the rental and the Blu-ray and all that sort of stuff. Um, do you want to do you want should we score it? Should we do a? Oh yeah, let's do a score on this one. A rating. Uh, what are you thinking for um, this uh, Justin Pearson documentary? Then what's your score? Four out of five. Like I say, it's, it's hugely enjoyable. Mm. I got so much like out of it, and like it trans. I'm of that age, so it just takes me back to what yeah. scenes were, like the bands that are mentioned, like the scene, like the scenes that existed, and all the rest. Yeah, I fucking lived through that. So yeah, um, yeah it, like, it struck a, a nice nostalgia uh, thing for me. But also, as someone who is relatively creative, not on his level, but someone that you know, relatively active, and we still do stuff, even if it's podcast related. Um, seeing the struggle. Mm. It's something I can sympathise and empathise with, so yeah, yeah, 4 out of 5 for me. Yeah, I totally agree, yeah, 4 out of 5 for me as well. Um, for a lot of similar reasons, I felt this was a, a real kind of throwback, um, a lot of nostalgia for me as well. Um, and from someone that's been in a band, I could relate to a lot of the stuff that actually <laughs> yeah. went on the, the documentary. But I also felt like even if you're not into like hardcore and punk and grindcore or whatever, you'd, you'd still get a lot out of this documentary. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of it that's just really fun to watch and interesting and fascinating to hear about. So If you like male penis. <laughs> also, yeah. Check out. Some of that in there for you. Uh, cool. So, um, yeah, that's our review of <laughs> the new um, Justin Pearson documentary, Don't Fall in Love With Yourself. Uh, I'll put some links below to, uh, to the blu-ray and the the rental and stuff like that so you can check out so let us know what you think